Right, this is a story, I've actually called it a most unlikely story, because in actual fact, as the story progresses, you'll see just how unlikely the story actually was. It's also about a world famous designer and some of the, and this particular legendary car that he, he produced. Um, as I said, it's called a most unlikely story. After a number of false starts, just when it appeared that this car would hit the streets and go into production, the Second World War started on the 3rd of September 1939, which put paid to that car being produced at that point in time. But after the war, the factory was in, that was to produce this car was 65% destroyed. And the British, first of all, the Americans moved in for two weeks into Vorsburg in Germany. And then the British Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers Division arrived. And they had a look at this factory, which was virtually, say, totally destroyed, wondered if they would ever get a car. But Ivan Hurst, who was put in charge of the factory, was an absolute Volkswagen fan. And a gentleman of the name of Colonel Michael Yeah, that's better. Can you hear now? Okay. Yeah, Michael McAvoy was a colonel in the British Army. And before the war, actually in, in um, February 1939 at the Berlin Motor Show, he drove a Beetle, one of the Beetles that were produced for propaganda purposes. And he wrote, This year's exhibition was no principally notable for an event which may mark a new era in motoring. He didn't know what he was saying. That was 1939. Said the introduction of the Volkswagen, now to be known as the KDF Wagen. He went back to England, and in the April 1939 edition of the Sports Car Magazine, he wrote a glowing report about his road test of the Beetle. And incredibly, Michael McAvoy was posted to Vorsburg right after the war. The factory was going to be put up for reparations and to be sold off whatever they could sell off. First of all, an American delegation from the Ford Motor Company went to the factory and Ernest Breach, who was Henry Ford's um, aide, reported back to Henry Ford, Mr. Ford, what we are being offered here is not worth a damn. Lord Roots from the Roots Group in England which produced Humber, Singer and all those cars, went to the factory, had a look around, reported back to his board. The car this factory was to produce is ugly in the extreme, noisy and has no commercial future whatsoever because it doesn't possess the vital requirements of a motor vehicle. So he turned down the Volkswagen as well. So now we are talking about the car, which now you've now heard is going to be the Beetle, and also the designer, which was Ferdinand Porsche. Right, number one. Designed many, many incredibly legendary motor cars. And of course, the Beetle was amongst them. Now, Ferdinand Porsche was born on the 3rd of September 1875 and when he was 19 years old in 1994 he secretly built, there are a number of story versions of this particular story but I've chosen one of them to tell you. He built a generating plant in the attic of their home in Reichberg, in, in uh, Reichberg. His father wanted the young Porsche to go into the tinsmithing business that he was running, but Porsche was not interested, Ferdinand was not interested at all. All he was interested in was motor cars, newfangled designs, and electricity. Those were the two things that grabbed him. But his dad would not let him go the way he wanted to go, 
and insisted that he join the business, especially when his elder brother was killed. Anyway, the old man Porsche found out about Ferdinand's generating plant up in the attic, went upstairs and trashed it. Unfortunately, he kicked over some batteries which splashed acid all over his feet, over his legs and burned his trousers. And I think he then realized that at long last, maybe Ferdinand should go his own way. So in 1894, when he was 19, he left and went to Vienna, to the technical college there where he studied. He also sneaked into lectures at Vienna University. He was not allowed to be there and eventually he was found out and thrown out. And eventually that very self-same university, years later, bestowed on him an honorary engineering degree. Anyway, he went to work for Bella Egger, an electrical company in Vienna, and he came to the notice of Jacob Lohner, who was a coach builder to the Austrian emperor. And Lohner was just beginning to get into motor vehicles. And in 1900, Porsche built an electric car called the Porsche, Lona Porsche. And it had two hub motors. Oh, sorry, this is his generating plant that he built, by the way. And he eventually got his way. He actually eventually wired up the house for electricity and the neighbor's house. And I think that's what convinced the old man to send him away. Okay, next one. This little car was powered by batteries, had a range of about 50 miles, about 80 kilometers before it had to be recharged. In 1901, he built another revolutionary car, designed and built this car. It had an internal combustion engine driving four electric hub motors, four-wheel drive in 1901, and a technology which is only being perpetuated now, more than a hundred years later. Okay. Okay, next one. Well, Porsche, after he left um, Jacob Lohner, went and worked for Austro Daimler in 1908. And he was there for 17 years. And he designed some amazing cars for them, but he just could not get on with the directors. And also the First World War intervened. But in 1920, 21, uh, sorry, we seem to have got, got ahead of ourselves here. In 1920, 21, he built a little car called the Sasha, which then could do 130 kilometers an hour in 1921. Anyway, Porsche then left... Um, Austro Daimler and joined Daimler Motor and which eventually became Daimler Benz. And there again he built some absolutely iconic cars like the Mercedes um, SS and the Mercedes SSK and the SSL. But again, Porsche was an extremely difficult man, something maybe he'd learned from his father. But he then left Daimler and went to Stair, but then the Wall Street crash happened in 1929. And he realized, working for Starr, that they were part of the same bank that owned major shares in Daimler-Benz. So he left, and in the middle of the world's worst recession in 1930-31, he opened up his own design studio. The first commission he had virtually was from Zuntup, who manufactured motorcycles. And Zuntup wanted a, a small car designed, but with a five-cylinder radial engine. Radial engines were meant for airplanes, not for motor cars. Anyway, Porsche designed the car. Uh, could, could we just go back? Just go back. Uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's it there, yeah. This was the Zuntup that he designed. rear engine, a backbone platform chassis, much like the Beetle would have in later years. But the five-cylinder engine was a total disaster. So after three cars were built, Zuntup cancelled the contract. But then NSU approached Porsche, and they wanted a small car as well, but with an air-cooled flat-four engine at the back, 
and Porsche designed a 1.5 litre engine which went into this car. Okay, next slide. And that's the car there, little NSU. Three was not Porsche's lucky number. After three prototypes had been built, Fiat went to NSU and said, hey guys, we've had an agreement since 1928 that you are not going to go into the motor car business. So the contract was cancelled with Porsche again. There was Porsche with a whole lot of motor cars that he could do nothing with and a dream to build a people's car. Anyway, sometime late in 1933, there's no date to this, Jacob Werlin, who was um, known to Porsche because he'd worked with him at Daimler-Benz, phoned Porsche and said, please, will you come to Berlin? I want to meet you at the Hotel Kaiserhof. Well, Porsche was a bit worried because at that stage he was beginning to work on designs for the, NSU, for the Auto Union racing car. And he was worried that Verlin, still being tied up with Mercedes, were going to steal some of his ideas. But he went anyway. And while they were talking, the door opened and in walked Adolf Hitler. Well, that was a most incredible meeting. Porsche and Hitler had the same idea for a German people's car. And Hitler then asked Porsche to submit an expose on what he believed a people's car should be like. Well, Porsche did the expose, presented it in January, and in uh, June of 1934, on the 22nd of June, which in actual fact in two days' time will be 81 years ago, a contract was signed with the German Automobile Industry Association, or Society of Automobile Manufacturers Association, for the production of two prototypes. Well, these prototypes were supposed to be delivered within 10 months. So they should have been delivered by April 1935. By April 1935, Porsche hadn't even decided on an engine. He'd already gone through, at that point, about eight or nine designs for different engines. Two-stroke, two cylinders, sleeve valves, all sorts of things. At least eight, nine designs of an engine. Okay. Anyway, eventually, at the end of 1935, Members of the society, I'm going to call it the RDA now instead of going through the whole thing every time. But members of the RDA were summoned to Porsche's villa where the two cars were being assembled in his four-car garage because there was just not enough money to send them to a proper manufacturer to actually assemble. They went on the 31st of October 1935. They had a look at the cars and at that point, it is assumed that they actually drove at least one of them. And that's why we have an 80th birthday this year for when, although it was a prototype, that the Beetle would actually be produced from those designs. Anyway, this picture shows the Porsche family in the Black Forest with the two cars, one a convertible, which is called the V1, and a sedan, which was called the V2. Now believe me, in, during the war, the Second World War, V1 and V2 bombs rained down on England. They were not Volkswagens. <laughs> right, I think there's another picture of the family outing. Now these cars had a 985cc engine producing about 23 kilowatts, 23 horsepower rather. Okay. Then, on the basis of what the RDA had seen in October 1935, very much against their will, because they represented Ford, Opel, General Motors, and this Volkswagen was going to implode into their business. So they did everything in their power, really, to try and stall the project, and that's why the project was eight months late, because spare parts were delivered late from manufacturers, all sorts of problems. But of course, we had Adolf Hitler sitting at the top saying, you will do it. So three prototypes were commissioned called the V3s. And these were then tested for 50,000 kilometers each. OK, I think we've got another one now. In the meantime, a guy by the name of Franz um, Rostov, uh, Rumspeed rather, 
had went had gone to Porsche and said, "Look here, Porsche, I can design a four-cylinder engine, giving you more horsepower than any of those engines that you have tried to use in the in the Volkswagen." So Rheinspeis went ahead, designed the engine. In actual fact, it was found that the four pistons for this engine cost less than the two pistons for the two-stroke engine that Porsche was favourable of. And this was an engine that eventually went on to power 21 and a half million Beetles, probably about 12 or 13 million combis, and numerous industrial versions of this engine. Probably one of the most produced engines ever. Four cylinder, horizontally opposed, 25 horsepower. Okay. Anyway, the, the cars were then um, put under Ferry Porsche's um, control. Ferry was, of course, Ferdinand Porsche's younger son. And the cars each did their 50,000 kilometers, but you cannot believe the problems that it existed. Broken crankshafts, burnt valves, all sorts of suspension problems, mainly because the quality of the parts supplied was not up to what uh, the standards that Porsche had demanded. But they completed their 50,000 Ks, and on the basis of that, another 30 cars were ordered, the bodies to be built by Daimler-Benz. That was the first body built by Daimler-Benz, was delivered to Porsche's villa in Stuttgart. And you can already see the basic Beetle shape here. And these cars, there were 29 sedans and one cabriolet, were all powered by Rheinspice's engine. They did, over a period of 10 months, 2 million kilometers in testing by 200 SS drivers who were sworn to secrecy. They were sworn to death if they imparted any secrets about these cars. They were an unmitigated success. And there was the first car, it was actually completed in Porsche's garage and then uh, Daimler-Benz did the rest. Now, the poor drivers who completed these two million kilometers couldn't even see out the back window because there was no back window. And also, they had suicide doors which were hinged on the A pillar at the front and if the door happened to fly open and the car was traveling, it would be ripped off and probably the passengers have fallen out. They were called suicide doors, not for nothing. Okay. And there are a couple of them parked in a German street in Berlin. Okay. Well, after the success of the VW30 series, Erwin Commender, who was Porsche's body designer, took that rather ugly design that we saw for the VW30s and streamlined it out, modified it, gave it two little back windows, and the Beetle was born in 1938. Well, on the 26th of May, 1938, the factory foundations were laid in Wolfsburg in Germany, and this is the day that Hitler actually laid the foundation stone for the factory. And there were three 38 model Beetles, one a cabriolet, one a sedan, and one a sunroof, were actually on display then. And Hitler drove away after the ceremony in the convertible through the crowds that were assembled there. Well, in 1939, early in 1939, journalists, motoring journalists from all over the world were invited to the Berlin Motor Show in February to test drive these little motor cars. Michael McEvoy, the gentleman I mentioned who was a colonel who ended up in Wolfsburg after the war, was one of the journalists and I mentioned wrote a glowing report in the sports car magazine of April 1939 about the Beetle and let me just read to you again what he said. This year's exhibition was principally notable for an event which may prove to mark a new era in motoring. That he said in 1939. Let me say at once that this little vehicle is a remarkable vehicle 
in the fullest sense of the word. He was an absolute Volkswagen convert. Okay. And there's Lawrence Pomeroy and Gordon Wilkins, who were two notable British journalists in the 1930s and 1940s even, even 1950s. And they also wrote glowing reports about this little beetle. Well, they now almost had a factory. How the were they going to sell this car? One of the guys from the German labor front came up with an idea that they would have a savings scheme that workers put a, could put away five Deutschmarks a week and after four years would be able to collect their Volkswagen from the factory. This is the savings card that they used. 336,000 Germans signed up almost immediately for their car. Not one was ever supplied. The reason being okay, that the few Volkswagens that were produced in 1939, 1940 and 41 all went to the German hierarchy. And of course on the 3rd of September 1939 the Second World War was declared by Britain on Germany for invading Poland. And here you can see some of the cars that were delivered to the German hierarchy. Okay. Volkswagen was then switched to wartime production and of course the Kubelwagen, the bucket car, was produced in many thousands, I think 43,000 were eventually produced. Rommel used it in North Africa, in the heat of North Africa. It was used in the Russian campaign, in the freezing cold there, and this air-cooled engine could cope with both without a problem. Rommel was absolutely sold on this Kubelwagen. And this is a four-wheel drive beetle called a Kommandierwagen. Now this picture was taken in the Wolfsburg Museum in Germany and even the great firm like Volkswagen make mistakes. This was not 1946, it was 1944. <laughs> and then they had other versions for the police and so on that were built there as well. But then the Wolfsburg, the factory, started producing parts for the JU-88 bomber and for the V1 and V2 rockets, so the factory became a target by the British and it was bombed really tremendously during the 1944-45 period. Okay. Also, they produced the Schwimmwagen, which was an absolutely amphibious Volkswagen. could drive off a river bank into the river, they dropped the propeller, it would go across, come out the other side, and drive off. Okay. That was part of the factory. It was 65% destroyed. When the Americans arrived, they were there for about two weeks and then Wolfsburg was declared in the British region and then Ivan Hurst and his team from the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers arrived at Volkswagen to this totally destroyed factory. Fortunately, a lot of machinery was moved away when the bombing started, so it would be safe. Okay. And the British renamed it Vosburg Motorworks. And they started producing beetles from anything that was lying around. They couldn't get carburetors, they couldn't get tires, they couldn't get glass, they could get nothing. How they even built these few was an absolute miracle. And then a, a gentleman by the name of Wing Commander Dick Berryman arrived at Volkswagen together with Michael McAvoy. And Dick Berryman in England had been an expert in production of motor cars. He started getting things sorted out, getting the rubble cleared from the factory, sourcing spare parts. And in March 1946, they built 1,000, this is not the 1,000th Beetle, but this was the 1,000th car built during March 1946. And then in October 1946, 
The 10,000th body shell came off the production line, filled with slogans from hungry, tired, homeless workers. Well, the British knew that at some point they would have to get a German to run Volkswagen, even, un even though it was still under British command. And they appointed Heinz Nordhoff to take over the Volkswagen factory. Now, Heinz Nordhoff is one of these typical examples of the situation with the Beetle. He hated the Beetle because of its Nazi origins, and he worked for Opel before the war and was totally involved with the RDA being forced into produce the Beetle. He hated the Beetle with a passion, but he needed a job, he needed a home, he needed food for his family, so he took the job and became, in the next 20 years, the father of the Beetle. He was totally and absolutely converted. Unfortunately, this photograph doesn't show, but in the book that I've written on the city golf, I've got a picture there and it says, Heinz Nordhoff with a few of his factory workers, but there were thousands there. <laughs> okay. Well, Nordhoff realized that he had to start exporting cars. So he went to Holland and got a gentleman by the name of Ben Pon as his representative in Holland, and the first cars were exported to Holland to Ben Pon for sale in Holland. That was the agreement that was eventually signed by the British, handing over Volkswagen back to the Germans. That was in 1949. Ben Pon, in the meantime, realized that America could be a market for the Beetle. So they exported two Beetles to America in 1949. Now, I don't know if you know the story about rabbits, how quickly they breed. Volkswagen brought out a very clever advert. Doyle Dane Birnbach, in fact, in America did it. It showed two rabbits sitting next to each other with their little noses twitching. And all it said was, in 1949, there were two Beatles in America. Later in America, they were selling half a million a year. Okay. Then in 1950, the 100,000th Beatle left the production line. And then, just a few years later, the one millionth Beatle came off the production line on the 5th of August, 1955. The one million had taken 10 years. The next million would take 27 months. Now please, I just want to say I had nothing, nothing to do with this advert. <laughs> nothing at all. What it's saying here, Doyle Dane Birnbach in the States in 1959 when they were appointed as uh, VW's advertising agents in the States, this advert, all it's saying is that the cubbyhole had a scratch on it so it was rejected by the 1,000 odd inspectors at the Volkswagen factory and that they keep the lemons and give the customers the plums. That's basically what it's saying. And now you might ask, what on earth does this figure mean? 15 million and 7,034. The 17th of February, 1972, when this Beetle left the production line, it broke the Ford Model T's 45-year record as the most produced single model in the history of the motor vehicle. Now, the Beetle, let me say it now, still holds that record to this day because as a single model, it has sold more than any other motor car, including Toyota Corolla, including the Golf, but as a single model, which means everything was still in the same place as from the very first one, it still had basically the same shape. I mean, Golf has now gone through seven, seven different models. Corolla has gone through probably about 16 or 18. But the Beetle is still exactly the same as it was in 1938 when that first basic Beetle came out. And then in 1981, after Wolfsburg had stopped production in 1974, Mexico and Brazil took over production. 
and the 20 millionth beetle was produced in 1981 in Mexico. And what is Volkswagen doing at this point? What they were doing was they were setting up factories all over the world because beetle sales were going absolutely mad. And so half a million beetles a year in the States. So Nigeria was set up as a beetle production point. Ireland, well, Australia, Mexico, Brazil, and South Africa, of course. And in 1946, South African Motor Assemblers and Distributors was started in Utenag, and they started building Studebakers after an agreement with Studebaker Corporation in the States. And they started building Austins, of all things. The factory foundations were laid in 1947, and the first cars started coming off the production line in 1949, which was a Studebaker. In 1951, in July, Heinz Nordhoff came to Utenag, together with Mel Brooks, who was then um, Managing Director of SAMED, South African Motor Assemblers and Distributors, and Baron von Utzen, who was Volkswagen's representative in South Africa, and they signed the agreement to start building beetles in Utenag. Well, the first beetle came off a production line on the 31st of August, 1951. Now let me just, uh, sorry, I don't want to hold you up for too long, but there's a little bit of a story behind this car. And I stumbled onto it after years and years and years of pondering over a similar photograph, but with people standing in front of the car. When I got this picture in 2001, when I was doing a, a history for Volkswagen's 50th anniversary, it suddenly dawned on me that there was something wrong with this picture particularly. Why would the tires have been painted with black tire paint with a car just coming off the production line. And that was what puzzled me about the first picture. Then I looked at the right front wheel and if you look on the inside of the wheel, it's filthy dirty. Then I started checking back and I found that in 1951, in March, Volkswagen had sent a complete Beetle to Utenag for evaluation purposes. In April, some changes were made to the Beetle. A chrome surround was put in the windscreen surround. And the little badge, the Wolfsburg badge, was put on just above the, the handle of the front bonnet for the first time in April. Now, the car in, made in March would not have had those features. Does this one have a badge? Does it have a chrome surround in the windscreen? No, it doesn't. But if you look at the car behind, it has both the chrome surround and the badge. I've got a picture taken from higher up and this car shown without seats and door panels. I think what happened was they let the press know 31st of August the first Beatles coming off the line. It wasn't ready. So they used the one sent from Germany as the first car. <laughs> they weren't very happy with me when I found that out. <laughs> but anyway, that's a, a story of a most amazing vehicle and one that lives on today in vast numbers. And I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Thank you.